So we start the post-lunch session. The first speaker is uh, Shamadip Tepain of the Indian Institute of Public Health. Uh, I'll okay. I, I mean, you've already given a talk. Yeah, that's this. what. Thank you. Okay, very good afternoon. So once again, uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation and uh, I'm glad to get the opportunity to come back to this campus almost 20 years later. And it's, it's a, always a nice feeling uh, to come back to uh, meet with fellow mathematicians and of course uh, the students and uh, other delegates. Uh, so some of you might have uh, attended my yesterday's lecture. So there are a couple of slides which are common, but uh, I couldn't assume that all of you have, so I've just left them, okay? Uh, so my today's uh, lecture theme is more in along the lines of research that we, at least, at least along one of the lines of research that we pursue in the lab. And uh, it's titled Computational Biosecurity Based on Immunophenome Analysis. So computational biosecurity is what we are, what our aim is, and one of the routes to reach that aim is through studying of the immunophenotype of human subjects. Of course, it, it's, a, it's a general methodology that could be used for um, similar analysis of any other subject, but we will look at human data today, okay? And uh, as I might have if, if you've, uh, heard me speak yesterday, so I'm based in Public Health Foundation of India's Indian Institute of Public Health, which is located in Hyderabad. Uh, very recently, I was also in, uh, as part of uh, CRO, Advanced Institute of Mathematics, Statistics, and Computer Science. So the work has been done in all these places. It's also part of the work is done in the US, and I'll tell you when, when, it, when we come to that. Okay, in Broad Institute of MIT, Harvard University. Okay, before I forget, I forgot yesterday. A little bit of advertisement, and that lets you settle down after lunch, probably with this treat. Uh, so there's going to be an international symposium on health analytics and disease modeling, just because um, many of you have uh, probably shared this uh, same interest area, and some of the organizers will be present there as speakers, invited speakers. So it's on 29th February and 1st March in Indian Institute of Public Health in Hyderabad, and there is no registration fee, so that should kind of stimulate uh, participants to apply. You may not find it easy to apply by the deadline, which is tomorrow, but don't worry, do it as soon as possible. I'm told that's the way to go, okay? So <laughs> deadline is soft, but not too soft, because you know we have to meet at some point of time in a matter of four or five days to kind of make sure we, we can go ahead. Uh, so please log in to this site and and, uh, and register. Okay, that's it. And if you're interested, it's pre-conference to uh, the 17th International Congress on Infectious Diseases. So if you're interested in infectious diseases, the whole world will be gathered in Hyderabad, okay? Uh, the world of infectious diseases uh, on March two to five. So that's just, um, you know, two days ahead of that. So you can make it a, a, an aligned uh, tour if you want, okay. So yesterday I was telling you that uh, this is the area of, of our team's work. It's yeah, along two axes. One is uh, high dimensional data generated by um, bioinformatic, bioinformatic platforms for, uh, for analysis of high, dim high dimensional and high resolution data uh, generated by different omic platforms as well as different new platforms that we are trying to support. Uh, so 
today's work will actually touch upon some of the work that we do with high resolution data and we need special modeling techniques for those. We'll discuss that. As well as another axis of uh, biostatistics where traditional biostatistics is combined with uh, large data generation sources to do modeling and prediction based on different types of, uh, uh, of some of the kind of models that you already will have heard of today or will be hearing about in the next couple of days. Okay. All right. So uh, where do such sources of large data come from uh, in general? This will give you a background of the work kind of work we do. Uh, so this is a image which actually uh, we can, uh, I would be happy to attribute to an earlier publication. We actually uh, uh, use this image to also make a point for the late, in the latest uh, Elsevier handbook of uh, big data. We have uh, reviewed the field of computational epidemiology uh, with uh, my co-authors, uh, Professor Madhav Marathe and Dr. Anil Bulikanti, who was one of the speakers here. I'm uh, not seeing him here, but so this is from that uh, review. And this shows that in the hit history of infectious diseases is one of the places uh, that you could look for uh, conscious, proactive efforts of generating large data. In the past, there were not too many real um, motivations for generating large data. Um, maybe a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of state-sponsored census, which would happen in certain countries, but not otherwise. But at least in the area of infectious diseases, starting from the Middle Ages, where people were interested in how to avert uh, large epidemics like plagues, etc., they were sharing information with each other, traders and people who moved around. They would actually give information, pass information about what types of things are happening where. And much of that information actually not only got shared, but some of that also got preserved. Uh, sometimes even in the form of stories and anecdotes and art. Okay, in the, in the Renaissance period, at least in Europe, uh, uh, that gave rebirth to thinking, led to, I mean, rebirth of thinking, which uh, about, uh, about uh, critically, thinking critically about how diseases occurred. And uh, for that purpose, data were studied uh, to understand the health status in a population level again, but also in sometimes in, in, in personalized uh, treatment. In industrial age, uh, industrialization led to overcrowding, basically uh, urban management uh, came into being then sanitation issues, and then subsequently there were epidemics. Uh, so the policymakers, especially uh, statesmen from different countries had to meet together and address health problems and sanitation issues. So this is actually a, a, a quite a turning point because around this time also the germ theory was uh, started getting postulated and people started first time getting an understanding of really how uh, diseases occur and spread. Then, of course, 20th century, discovery of penicillin and all kinds of um, uh, medical advances, in particular vaccination against childhood diseases, and suddenly longevity shot up to um, kind of close to where we are now. Okay? So this is, of course, medical breakthroughs. And then 21st century is where we are now. Human Genome Project is completed, and so we kind of get a lot of information, large amounts of data reside in those databases in the form of genomic data and other kinds of uh, data. We are looking at also the other space. So uh, I was uh, referring to Broad Institute of MIT. That's the world's foremost institute for genomics. So almost 30 to 40 percent of world's genomic data resides and is generated by just that one institute. Uh, but along with that, we are also interested in phenotypes, in particular in the context of today's talk, immunophenotypes. So we are interested in a variety of uh, of data that comes from disease space, but also uh, increasingly we can track diseases through social media and the new kinds of technologies, okay? All right. So the context is uh, uh, where we work is threat of emerging zoonotic diseases. Uh, zoonotic diseases, the trend has been particularly um, not very good. Um, it's unfortunately steadily increasing incidence since 1940s, even if you control for the effects of higher reporting. Okay, uh, so uh, in India there is not too many reporting agencies unfortunately, I don't want to say this as a fact, but uh, it's kind of, there are reporting agencies, but I don't know how, um, um, how seriously integrated those efforts are. Okay, uh, so it's also sometimes easy, not that easy to get the data very uh, timely and regularly. 
Uh, also, it has been found that 60 percent of known human uh, infectious diseases and more than 75 percent of newly emerging infectious diseases have zoonotic origin. When I say zoonotic origin or zoonotic disease, I mean that the disease first originates in vertebrate animals before being transmitted to human like uh, you are here, here of swine flu and all kinds of other diseases. Right? Uh, a conservative estimate puts the number of viruses, most of these are of viral origin. Uh, a number of viruses present in vertebrate species are conservatively estimated at, not at a million, which suggests that more than 99.9 percent uh, of the viruses that lie out there is currently unknown to us. So, the almost the entire thing is unknown, which can still infect us. So, of course, the route of transmission becomes very important here. Uh, if you are concerned about that, especially if you are from India, you might want to know about the global distribution of the relative risk of emerging infectious diseases. So, these are the events put on the map. Red means a lot of events, green means not that many. So, these are risk maps in terms of the risk map, uh, risk which are estimated in terms of the events. Uh, and this first map is uh, zoonotic pathogens from wildlife. Second one is zoonotic pathogens from non-wildlife like pets and cattle and livestock. Then uh, drug resistant pathogens and these are outbreaks of uh, vector borne pathogens and you can very easily tell that India figures in red in all of them. Okay? So, if you are studying this particular area, this is a, a, a very, very key and important area to study. Um, this may be the, my guess is that this is probably due to immigration because uh, that is the entry point of United States. Uh, it is probably not due to too much of forest cover degeneration and all that because there is not much forest cover left. So, western coast has been the oldest settled. So, the forest cover is mostly gone. Even if there is forest cover there is not much as rich wildlife diversity as you would expect. If you go to Maine you will find some trees, but they do not have that many vertebrate animals there left. So, but they are the hot spot for a lot of immigrants entering for example, in Florida and other places. I do not want to go to that is uh, that is a different um, uh, topic because it has other kinds of issues. And there is of course, Central America where you have a lot of uh, warm weather and other issues. This is the equator passing around here. So, a lot of tropical issues there. Uh, so, you need to study it systematically and in order to study zoonotic uh, interfaces systematically where they cross over from the natural reservoirs of animals to the human interfaces, uh, you have to do it using a multidisciplinary approach. So, uh, this is a picture from CDC, you will, if you see that they basically highlight the ways in which for example, bats and um, you know uh, pigs and other kinds of animals which lie in the interface. So, there are movies made to drive home this point. There is a, a, a movie a few years ago, Hollywood movie called Contagion. So, and then uh, outbreak also. In fact, I uh, invited last year Ian Lipkin from Columbia is a very famous epidemiologist and uh, viral virus hunter. So, he was there, he's found thousands of new viruses. So, he was uh, the actually the uh, the consultant for contagion and he was telling us how these type of uh, kind of uh, uh, transmission routes are fairly part of life in Africa and uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia and many other places. Okay, so, that is a fascinating area if you are interested in transmission routes etcetera. How do you go about it? This is how we try to go about it. So, we have this integrative model approach. So, we have one part is as I was telling you, if you are interested in pathogen, pathogen discovery, this pathogenomics, metagenomics, phylogenomics. So, all this is large num large amounts of data from viruses. For example, Broad recently uh, um, sequenced the Ebola virus. So, you get all the kind of data you need here, but uh, what you also need is the dynamic study of how the how the, how the mutations happen and viruses uh, change over time, especially RNA viruses which change uh, much more rapidly and do not get corrected quickly. So, they, 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 they have to be studied in terms of their dynamics. Then there is the population aspect. I uh, will uh, talk today more about population immunophenotyping, but genotyping, serological surveys I was talking about yesterday and so on. So, then again there is a lot of data from health space. And then there is a lot of uh, data which are coming from different types of observations which keep happening automatically like monitoring and surveillance syndromic surveillance, web mining, social networks, remote sensing. This is a growing space. 
okay? And then you put, try to uh, some way get the data in together. It's not at all easy to do that, uh, not methodologically, just to get the data in one place, okay? That's very, very, that's the most difficult part in my opinion. Then you start mining, mapping, clustering, prediction, etc. okay? So that's the standard idea. So in different boxes, we are at different levels of progress. And this is again an international multidisciplinary uh, approach. Today I'll concentrate on this part. Okay, so conceptually, what's the idea? Uh, the steps, are, these are the steps in which you proceed. Collect, generate multivariate data streams on health events through biosurveillance mechanisms, sensor surveys, electronic health records, news items, unstructured data, social networks, etc. Then you create a temporal database in high dimensional space of which only some of the dimensions are observed by each individual stream. Uh, design, then you design solutions uh, to the so-called statistical matching problem uh, to stitch together a partially identifiable set of high dimensional features. Uh, so basically you have each stream giving you multivariate input but only about certain features, okay, of the overall system. So you get partial uh, images and then you have to stitch together to get a, a larger image and that image should correspond to the health or well-being of the population. So you can think of it that way. So the, the entire population, uh, population's health, depending on different parameters, is like in high dimensional space. It's, uh, each point is a multivariate point and each, point is, uh, each dimension is coming from a different uh, type of data. Then you do not have many types of data available from many streams, but if you stitch together, it's, in high, it's a high dimensional cloud of points. Each point is an observation and that observation is multivariate. Now you have a high dimensional multivariate cloud of points. You model it with a mathematical statistical distribution that captures the variation over time and space. And then if it departs from that in some way or the other, you think that the system is changing. It is changing either due to some um, certain risk factors or certain other kinds of uh, predictable or non-predictable reasons. So that's how you kind of determine the health or well-being of the system. You fit suitable, as I was saying, fit suitable multivariate probability distributions to model the most meaningful features to parametrically characterize the concept of health. Finally, you detect outlier or drift in such concepts. Drift is, here is a technical term, but let's say basically means outliers and the concept is changing, uh, its parameters of the distributions are changing over time based on statistically significant changes in the estimated model parameters to understand outbreaks. So that's the whole idea. If you can go ahead that way, then you can answer these questions and I'll try to answer some of these today. These questions are of base central interest to us key questions for us. How to mathematically characterize a normal subject's immunophenotypic profile? Uh, so nobody is really normal in that sense. There's no absolute canonical normal person. So it has to be a, a, a profile with some statistics attached to it. So it can capture the diversity, okay? So how to model a diverse range of population immunophenotypes? How to group those population immunophenotypes into meaningful classes? How to map the immunophenotypic classes over geographical space and time? How to assign correct classification to new or rare immunophenotypes? How to rapidly detect any departure or outlier from a given range of normal profiles? How to represent population profiles in databases because it's statistically large amounts of data. Uh, so how to uh, cleverly store them in databases so that you can allow uh, mining and fast queries? How to find association between population genotypes and immunophenotypes? So this is where the association comes in between genotypes and phenotypes. And then how to identify a vulnerable or resistant subpopulation, a group of people based on such association. Let's say if you're interested in some people who live near the forest or who have a certain very specific kind of diet or other exposure. So how do you find such subpopulation based on the associations you find in this earlier step? And then how to systematically estimate the risk and parameters of potential outbreaks in a given population if you have such data. So these are some of the questions, okay? So now let's go to the data. And we are interested in immunophenotype data. There are different ways of generating such data. We wanted some high resolution techniques just because uh, many of our immunologist friends wanted to actually use those techniques in the clinical setting, okay? So, uh, but there are also low resolution methods that are possible. High resolution methods allow us to answer questions in more um, subtle ways. Okay, so immunophenotype data generation and modeling. The data set I'll show you will be of the kind automated per cell multi-marker expression analysis. So for each cell, each cell as in 
let's say if you have blood sample, for each cell you're measuring multiple markers. So you are measuring, let's say, P markers per cell, and that's your data set. Okay? And so it's high dimension because you're measuring P markers. P could be high. It's high resolution because it's at the resolution of each cell. Let's say if you're looking at immune cells. And then it's high throughput because, let's say, if it's blood samples, it can easily have hundreds of thousands of cells, if not millions of cells. So you have very large data per person. Okay? So this data could be that large. Okay. So um, high dimensional data to determine every individual semen of phenotype. In this case, we are using the, uh, the, the flow cytometer as our instrument here. It's present in almost all clinical laboratories and even basic biology labs. Uh, flow cytometer measures the expression of multiple markers. This is typically in the uh, usual labs. It's between, I would say, 8 to 15 markers. Uh, for for each individual cell in the sample, this can easily go from uh, millions to tens of millions. Uh, in each blood sample drawn from an individual. So you get a data matrix of something like this. So this is just one sample. It has a billion observations per person per sample. Each row is a marker that is expressed by each cell, which is a row. Okay? Each column is a marker. Okay? So that's your data matrix for just one sample. Okay, now this poses a lot of technological challenge, uh, both from the side of the machine and from the side of analysis. Typically, that challenge is not felt because the kind of analysis that's been done traditionally for the last 40 years is very uh, low dimensional. It's generally bivariate analysis. Some operator will actually, uh, some human, op human operator will take that data set and look at it in two dimension. Okay? So, and visually try to get the uh, expression of different types of markers in cells. So, this is how the two dimensional data looks like. This is from our uh, collaborators lab in Stanford. This is a data set that is where each point is uh, corresponds to a cell, okay? And the dimensions are different markers that you have measured. And so, it tells you how much each cell is measuring uh, which marker. And so, this is all, each of these points are present in all these plots. So they have uh, generated, uh, I can see, at least nine dimensional data. So you can see eight dimensions on the y axis and one on the x. And there may be more dimensions also that they have measured. And they are looking at it at two at a time. Okay? So the same data set, they're basically projecting in two dimensional spaces and looking at it. Okay? So each point is present. Each cell has, been, has a representation point in all these uh, plots. Okay? Now, this, you can see that this type of data has a lot of issues. Okay? It's very high quality data, high resolution data, but there are a lot of issues, especially you can see from the entire geometric nature of these distributions that, that those uh, issues have to be studied systematically because in high dimensional space, what's happening is very difficult to say uh, because even in two dimensional, they look complex enough. Okay. A cell population cloud, if you just the um, informally call it a cloud of points, often shows stochastic or non-clonal behavior by floating around in very high dimensional space. In, if they were a clonal population, all derived from one single cell, they would have very nicely probably peaked at the same, same spot, showing the similar expression, one spot just maybe at most a little bit of circular uh, uh, distribution. But you can see all kinds of properties are shown, which does not look like uh, their uh, circular, elliptical, or Gaussian distributions. Okay? And especially this is in low dimension. We don't even, can't even visualize what happens in real NP dimensional data. Okay. An immunophenotype is defined as a snapshot of a certain mixture of clouds. The clouds here represent various cell populations, subpopulations for a given subject. Okay. So what do we do? We'll go, I'll tell you what we do. So I told, showed you this slide already yesterday for those who uh, didn't attend. Very quickly, what we, uh, the approach that we take is called uh, finite mixture models to model the immunophenotype in a way that uh, allows the parameters of the model to capture the subpopulation dynamics. Here, by subpopulation, I don't mean population, subpopulation of people. I mean subpopulation of cells. Okay? So there are groups of cells doing various things. So, for example, subsets of T cells that you're interested in, sort of subsets of B cells. So these are all immune cells which have their property and that those properties determine the phenotype. 
Okay. So, for instance, this is a historic example of Carl Pearson looking at data from crabs and trying to show if there is any divergence happening in the species. It looks like, so y axis is, uh, x axis is size of crabs and this histogram tells you, okay, so probably there is only one peak, but probably there are subpopulations in the tails which shows there is a divergent group of crabs and they are kind of being very different from the normal group or the parent group. Okay. So, this type of uh, uh, model fitting exercises have been going on since 1890s etcetera and mixtures of distribution statistical distributions are typically very good um, very natural approach for that because here the mixture components can actually look at each subpopulation and when the component does uh, parameters change then you know the subpopulations are probably changing or diverging. So, we are going to uh, actually adapt the same approach to our analysis. However, I was showing you earlier that there was a lot of uh, these uh, lot of outlier cells. Typically, there are a lot of outlier cells and other kinds of heavy tailed activity, which other uh, which other words would be uh, probably in other studies you would just call them outliers and throw them out. But here, each cell is telling a story, and no, nothing is really an outlier. Now, you can you may not like that cell, but why it is expressing that way is something that the biologist has to account for. Just can't brush it under the carpet, so they're there. So you have to model them, and you have to see what is happening. Typically, when conditions change and there has to be an immune response or there has to be an immune suppression or any kind of uh, act change activity act, uh, then those happen probably early in on in the tails uh, right not necessarily in the modes in the centers okay or where the mode or the median is. So, that is why these uh, you have to model them and also they are typically very asymmetric and, um, and skewed. So, we you need distributions which can actually take care of those type of features. Um, and it, the data transformation does not get rid of them. So, it, it, they are real features and you could probably say that I do not care, but then your inference will be way off. Okay. Um, and uh, so, we came up with a family, we basically revised a family of distributions called skew, skew normal and skew t rather in generalized uh, skew family of distributions with heavy tailed effects that can be captured and then over 10 years we refined this family to uh, give us better and better quality modeling. Now, we take that distribution probability density function for those distributions and attach weights for each of those uh, cell populations and then we can uh, fit a mixture to the data. Uh, yes, yeah. So, this is by the variance and the distributions? Uh, these distributions, uh, the skew family of distributions uh, you take, uh, so the, the, uh, the earlier parameters are still there. For example, uh, the normal and the t distributions parameters would be there, but then there would be also skew parameters. Mm -hmm. And those skew parameters are uh, typically done by uh, attaching uh, another uh, 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 CDF with that, which goes from 0 to 1. So, it pushes the PDF from one side to the other. So, in the, if it is 0, then it is not skewed at all. If it is 1, it is heavily skewed. And so, I can give you the distribution that is yeah, fairly. These are different from Gumbel and so on, which also so, have a yeah, tail so and skewness. Uh, so, others, other, of course, all the other distributions also, there are a lot of skew distributions, but we wanted to kind of keep the properties of normal and T, uh, which were kind of the traditional way of doing such modeling, inflow cytometry and such data. Uh, but we said that, okay, probably in uh, 60 percent of the traditional, very traditional analysis that will suffice. So, in other words, the, the skewness estimate will be close to 0. The parameter for skewness will not give us anything much, very insightful. But then there will be other subtle immunophenotypes, which while keeping the normal and T type of this family of distributions um, in place, now we will need that extra. So, we just, we just wanted it in a incrementally going ahead. Because if we used some other uh, more um, you know new novel distributions people would have resisted using them even more. So, we wanted to do it incrementally, but still that was a lot of work. So, uh, we want this complex distributions of immunophenotype data which are heavy tailed skewed multimodal means many peaks and high dimensional. Uh, so, we needed these distributions you can see this is real data from uh, there is a, a famous project which uh, is remember the name of the cohort now. Um, anyway, it will come back to me. So, uh, we this is uh, real data from that project and uh, you can see all these type of features in the data, a HapMap project. So, that is the HapMap cohort. 
uh, and then we, uh, of course, model that with our, our, I'll show you that with our models. Um, so the immunophenotype for a given subject in that case uh, is defined as a distribution of its points in the high dimensional marker space. Each points correspond to a single cell, each point in this data, each dimension corresponds to the expression of an immunologic marker. Okay? So it tells you how much is each marker expressed by each cell. And this is in high dimensional space. I'm just showing you two. This could be dozens of dimensions. These days we have instruments which can measure hundreds of dimensions. Okay. And uh, such expressions of immunologic markers is often stochastic and noisy. So you need very robust modeling. And also therefore, there is also there is significant diversity of immunophenotypes that presents a serious statistical modeling challenge. I already told you why. And this uh, features don't go away, they persist even after standard data transformations are applied. So for example, skewness doesn't vanish, uh, it's skew for a reason. So there's a lot of work in these families of distributions that has happened over the last 10 years, including uh, folks like Sujit Sahu and others who may be uh, from UK and part of the, the team. Uh, and we did our work also. And so you can see the data being modeled by skew T here. So it tried to cap it captures the mode correctly. If you're interested in uh, genotype phenotype association, you want to know the peak expression. So it captures the mode correctly. It captures the shape parameters correctly. And of course, it also uh, um, gets rid of these tails and all that. Okay. So typically, if you used a Gaussian mixture, it won't. It'll need two or three populations to model this, and it'll have no explanation for those extra distributions that it'll use. So there's no special theoretic or immunological dis, uh, justification for these models. They just we, what, it's the other way around. The first, well. we, uh, first we uh, model them, then we go back to the immunologist and let we say these are our findings. Can you make sense in that sense? So then they can actually, um, um, if, they, if, it's, if it's reproducible, typically they would have the sample, they can the technical replicates of the sample. And then they can extract out those cells and send them for further analysis. For example, look at their gene expression. Or if they are in cancer, then you can use those as certain kinds of, let's say, cancer stem cell properties. So they can probably put them back in the mouse and see if the tumor can be generated. So those, that's the approach. So its first uh, model is fit. We output all the cell populations, and then you have to verify them biologically. Okay, sorry. So once after you fit the model, and you can fit them, we you have Bayesian methods. We have, I was talking about MCMC sampling methods yesterday. We have uh, EM-based methods, standard machine learning techniques, basically, to model these uh, distributions. And then you have the model parameters of those distributions. They tell us about location, size. For example, if it were a Gaussian, you would know the mean, right? So location, size, size is that mixing proportion of, you remember, it's a weighted mixture. The, uh, so the size and then the covariance matrix tells us various things about the shape uh, of those distributions. And then other cri various criteria we use to choose the best model that's fit. These are typically from information theory. Uh, and then uh, after you have fit those models, you can ask questions based on the spatiotemporal features of those models. For example, if it's a time course data or cell, cell differentiation data, you will have a temporal component of what's changing. Like is the, is the uh, population spherical or oblong? Is the population vertical or slant orientation, volume, is it tight or diffuse? All of these have biological significance. Why that cell population is behaving in a particular way? Is there an exposure? Is there a kind of, is it induced by the vaccine? Is it ha happening due to immunosuppression? Uh, so all kinds of questions you can try to answer. And then there are different uh, statistical techniques, mostly from linear algebra that help you with doing that. So this is how the pipeline typically uh, uh, snapshot would look like this. So let's say this is a sample that we have. Each dimension is a marker. These are not cartoons. These are from the real paper, OK? Uh, but uh, this is high dimensional data. I'm just showing you three dimensions. Like I can't show you more uh, easily. So each point is a cell. It tells you how much expression of a particular marker is shown. Uh, and then uh, this is the cell populations that we identified in high dimensional marker space, not just three. They come, they are a result. They follow from a model fitting, which we did as showing you different populations. These are the 95th percentile of those distributions. This is a mixture model. And I can see five cell populations that we identified, the means you can see, as well as a variety of other shape and other parameters that were fit. 
And once you know how to do that, you could do that across cases and controls. You could do that over time points. You can see what's changing. Okay? So for example, if you're interested in a phosphorylation experiment across the phosphomarker, there will be certain cell populations of the same subject which will show increased expression. So it will move, for example, from lower to higher phosphorylation. However, not all cell, cell subsets will show that. Some cell subsets will, some won't. Some might have, might, may not change uh, position. So remember, position means expression of a mean expression of a certain marker. They may change shape, and that will have another interpretation, which means probably part of the subset is changing, so it's showing that expression, the other part is remaining there. So they're not changing location, but they're changing the orientation. So then there may be a subset of that subset that you may want to look into. So that gives rise to new biological hypothesis of how to go ahead doing this. But anyway, we have a mathematical representation. Now you don't have to work with the messy single cells. Now you have a nice clean data chart, data sheet. Why? Because you have those model parameters. So for each sample belonging to every class, you have all kinds of parameters like location, size, mode, variance, shape. You can have probably about few dozen parameters to play with. It's actually more than 60 parameters extracted from the data. And then you send them for standard downstream bioinformatic analysis like feature selection, um, visualization, classification, prediction, etc. Uh, combination across data sets. Okay. Now, if you want to, this is just for one sample what I showed you till now. For a sample. Okay. So one sample was modeled. So this is what I showed you. Now, if you want to now uh, scale it up to cohorts, large a population scale, you need some way to capture diversity. This again led to new research. And uh, then we proposed a multi-level model. It's a hierarchical uh, model fitting for immunophenotypic diversity in a cohort. So in this multi-level model, you, in the lower level, you are actually getting this cell populations model. So each of these lozenges floating in space is a cell population in a given sample. And now you also note that these are color-coded, right? So when I was looking at this cell population, I, uh, this sample, I got these cell populations using the modeling I told you. But I also got, similarly, the cell populations here. But how do I know this is blue and that is blue? How do I do the matching? That's a, in high dimensional, uh, if, if, if it's an arbitrarily high dimensional um, data space, it's called an NP-hard problem. It's a, it's a real computational challenge to do registration. This is called registration. Like you have, uh, registration is a common thing in image analysis, people who do image analysis. So for example, um, uh, registration of, uh, a very common problem in registration is, is if, the, if the pose of the face, for example, change in your facial images, you still have to get the face right. You can't say it's a different person just because the pose changed. So you have to have the features aligned. So registration is an important problem. And that uh, doesn't have many good solutions. So we had to come up with solutions there because it could be high dimensional space. In two dimensional space, it's easy to tell, like an image, you can tell by, by eye. But uh, for example, a nose is a nose in two photos. But in high dimensional space, you can't see the picture. So how will you do the registration? So you need a good solution for that. And then on top of it, now if you, even if you have registered, you can see the diversity that sometimes the cell population is high in some, low in some other, some it's um, inside another. So it's, it's a lot of diversity. So if this is each person's immunophenotype, and if you have 1,000 people in a population that you've sampled, then you have to again have a superstructure, a template for that class of subjects. So then we brought in, uh, so after you have solved the matching problem, to capture the flexible variation, or to capture the variation flexibly, we brought in a random effects model, which captures all these random effects together, and then stitches a template, which is for the entire population of what you have sampled, the entire cohort. Okay? So now you have a class template class template which have parameters which capture the diversity within that class. Okay? So you have an overall class template. Now if you have multiple classes to compare, let's say people who have an exposure and people who don't, or people who have exposure to different strains, now you can compare them by those class templates, the parameters of the class template. So it now comes down to the notion of when you do a two sample t-test, okay, you compare the means. So here you are comparing the mean curves or the mean templates, mean high dimensional surfaces and the parameters. So you, uh, the good thing is you're comparing the kind of the, the 
it's not the mean, it's actually captured by a model of summarization, but that model is parametric. So you're only looking at the parameters, you're not looking at the, the dirty part, you're looking at the clean parameters. Also they're highly multivariate, so which means you're simultaneously capture all the, all the diversity of along all the markers together. And most importantly, because you're kind of uh, doing it across classes, also there is this heterogeneity within classes which is taken care of by the random effects terms, which is different from fixed effect terms which does, don't take care of that. So it takes a bit of an exercise, but then finally you have an overall picture. So that's the random effects model on top, finite mixture model in the bottom, and finally you have a class template. Okay, so these are some of the illustrative examples very quickly. Uh, so to see how we model class diversity, let's say we have uh, this is from a database or a cohort called Immune Tolerance Network. It's in, based in the United States. What they look at is they draw blood samples from different classes of human patients and they look at their, I think, if I don't remember it very clearly now, but it's done a few years ago. But I think they look at um, probably the uh, immune response to certain vaccination events. And there are three groups of people and it's slightly different in each. So the dark line here is, so this is the class template, okay? It's a high dimensional class template. I'm just showing you two, but the data, trust me, is high dimensional. I'm just showing you CD4, CD8 cells, and this is how the distribution looks like, the projection of that high dimensional distribution in 2D space. And what you are seeing is a mixture model fit, so you can see the contours of each of the distributions. So I can say somewhere between two to four, uh, distributions there, two to four subsets of cells. So I'd probably say four subsets of cells, there's one here, one there, one something happening here, something happening there. This is a contour of that distribution, overall distribution. So this is a whole class of samples, so that's why you have so many curves. And this dark curve is the class template, which is kind of the mean, the representative of the whole class of patients. This is for class one of patients, this is class two, and this is class three. So there are three sets of patients and the uh, and the, and the contours of the fitted distribution for each patient is shown and as well as the contour of the class template. So it's a busy picture, but it has a lot of things happening and put together, okay? So this is model data. Now if you have those class templates, what you can do is you can quantify, you have quantified the parameters and now you can compare them in high dimensional space, what's happening? So these are the three class templates, red, green, and blue, three class of patients, and this is how their kind of average immunophenotype looks like in these two dimensions. Again, this is high dimension, I can't show you, but in two dimension, this is how it looks like. So if you're interested in, let's say, what happens in terms of CD4 positive, CD8 positive T cells, then you suddenly see that the three classes probably have some divergence there. They do not have very similar, so these are very important subclasses of T cells that you would like to know, and probably there's divergence there. Probably there's not so much divergence between blue and red classes, but divergence from green in CD4 negative, CD4 8 positive subset. And possibly there's no dissimilarity much at all, significant dissimilarity in CD4 positive and CD8 negative. So these are the kind of stories you can now very easily tell because you have that parameter mat matrix which has been populated as a result of this modeling. And then you can of course go to do statistical testing of comparing distributions high dimensional distributions and then there are a lot of tests for those comparing distributions including some that we have devised based on different types of distances that you can compute across distributions. So if I've given two distributions, uh, basically PDFs, probability density functions, then here it's not a simple PDF, it's a mixture PDF, uh, then you can compare them by computing distributions across these, dist uh, these templates, okay? And as I told you, if you can register each of the cell populations, then over time you can see how the cell popul subsets are behaving. For example, you can say if there is certain kinds of inflammation, certain kinds of allergies, certain kinds of other infections that's happening, that particular subset which was expressing earlier at certain levels, what happens over time. So you can have also monitoring possible. And this is very easy to do in the lab, but this can also be done using certain kinds of surveys in the immunological surveys also in the ground. Okay, now if you know again how to do that, you can bring in more statistical machinery to do even more uh, interesting stuff. So you can move from uh, comprehensive immunophenotype modeling, which we were doing till now, to rapid outbreak detection. So you have this type of data, high dimensional data again, mind you, and then you can model that. If you model that in terms of these 
uh, peaks and valleys, then actually statistics allows you to kind of come up with a ridge representation going from peaks and valleys. It is, it's a basically a, a dimension reduction from high dimensional landscape to lower dimensional projections, which keep the information kind of uh, still there, information intact. And then if you, once you have that, once you have these curves, then you can cluster curves. If you could cluster uh, landscapes and they get very hard to do when the dimension increases to more than 10 or 12. Remember these involve a lot of integration, so that is never easy. You need fast numeric methods or otherwise the parameter estimation becomes very slow. They never, very rarely they have closed form solutions of those parameter estimation which I was talking about. So then they become mathematically challenging, but you can also reduce their dimension to curves and curves are linear structure, I mean not linear curves are lower dimensional structures and then you can cluster curves and then you can see if some, if you do such curve clustering for multiple samples, now new samples keep coming in and then if they are different in some, some aspect, you can probably uh, catch them quickly. And you can apply these to various kinds of, uh, of applications. I will show you a few applications. I do not know how much time I have left. Depending on that, I will pace myself. Ten minutes. So, I will do it a little quickly. So, let us say I will show you a quick application from cancer. Uh, so, this was a collaboration with Stanford Medical School. Uh, so, this uh, cancer is called follicular lymphoma patients, uh, patient stratification study. So, follicular lymphoma is a cancer which happens as a result of uh, B cell receptor signaling impairment uh, in lymphoma B cells and that is originally detected by this team using phosphoproteomic markers. These are like immune markers, but upon phosphorylation. Uh, phosphorylation. So, B cell receptor is a complex of proteins which do signaling downstream, uh, do signaling uh, regulation downstream uh, to do cell division and uh, cell survival. So, basically whether a cell will divide or survive will depend on such signals which B cell receptor sends. Uh, uh, certain non-clonal cell populations were found by them to be associated with clinical outcomes, which means they found when I said non-clonal, they did not behave like one group of cells, but like kind of somewhat different. They find certain cell pop subsets of cells are there, which if they are present or they are absent, that has a clinical outcome, which means the patients have a good prognosis or a bad prognosis for the disease. Okay. Uh, so, that is what they were using it for. We said, why do not you look at high dimensional uh, data set and let us uh, see what we find. So, we looked at a large number of markers. Uh, we actually looked at the pathway of B cell signaling, uh, of uh, B cell receptor signaling and then using a multiplexed design of this study, because we could not look at so many markers in one go. So, we had to uh, you know multiplex the samples and do them in parallel. Uh, and once we did that, we had a very interesting finding which we published last, last year. Um, so, here we got improved patient sample classification than what they had found before. So, this is just showing you two dimensions. There were of course, this was like as I told you about 30 plus dimensions we were looking at. And there was uh, a certain subset of cells, one of those clouds were found to be having a skewed or diagonal type orientation in patients which had good outcome as opposed to patients which had poor outcome where it was uh, circular. That probably meant that there were subsets of cells which were impaired and other subsets of cells which were not. So, uh, and that extra subset of cell probably was uh, create was responsible for the good outcome in patients, but no such uh, signal was present in the poor outcome. So, this was using pure mathematics absolutely uh, to find something which is uh, which had prognostic value in the lab actually in the clinic. Um, so, this is uh, a field that is getting more and more popular, it is called cellular heterogeneity. Uh, so, what happens in subsets of cells and so, this is for example, that same data set on the marker that I was actually looking at PLC gamma marker. And if you find that upon phosphorylation, the patients with good outcome, they had shown this tail population, uh, which probably showed that they had uh, cells which were not impaired, which was like the original population as opposed to the signaling was impaired in the uh, patients which, which had poor outcome. So, we could show a survival difference. So, this was pure mathematical information with applied information, uh, with applied uh, with applications that had some prognostic value. And then we actually wanted to do clinical trials with this signature with that which is on the way. 
Uh, okay, so there's a lot of work going on over last decade. I told you the nature methods called it the great groundbreaking method and we applied it to a variety of other studies. I don't have too much time, but I'll be happy to share references with you if you're interested. Uh, more and more applications that we are doing, slightly different technology, but we are using single cell level analysis, uh, mostly uh, at MIT, but also uh, with partners probably in India. In the, so they come in, at this point of time, we are looking at them in three spaces. One is in microbial evolution and pathogen discovery, drug resistance, that area uh, with uh, immunologists. And then with uh, tumor heterogeneity, with more, uh, more and more cancer stem cells, et cetera, with cancer biologists. And then also in reproductive uh, so, and regenerative biology where we look at you know, small subsets of cell with these regenerative potentials. So the whole idea is very general. If you have large cell, uh, groups of cells, then there are probably small subsets with special property. If you can capture them and study their dynamics, they tell you many things about the changing immune system, the regeneration of tissues, the can cancer reappearing. So that's a recurrent theme. It comes back again and again. All that you need is a good modeling tool, and then you follow the parameters of the tool, of the, of the, of the output of the tool. Okay, so I don't want to go into all the work that we are doing in single cell analysis because we don't have time for that. We are doing it for metagenomics. The whole idea is something like this. For example, if you're interested in monitoring drug resistance using single cells, so you design a microbiological framework in which an initial identical population of microbial cells are subjected to selection pressure from antibiotics or antimicrobial agents, and thus they are pushed to evolve in a succession of steps to probably develop resistance to the drug. So not all cells develop resistance to the drug. Most of them get killed off. A few do. And when those do, you want to study the mechanism. You st isolate them in, at the level of single cells, and you test for them what are the mutations, and qualify and quantify the frequency of those outliers and, uh, or those deviants which develop those mutations or probably ability to flush out drugs, et cetera. And then you uh, try to design uh, therapies to address that. That's the general idea. We tried to get the community together by coming up with a special uh, section for nature and frontiers in oncology uh, called single cell analysis. Many papers were um, published through here. If you are still interested in doing any work in this, let me know. Uh, we had about 24,000 reviews of, uh, views of these type of uh, resources. So um, that's the general idea of what we work on. Uh, the summary is uh, big data approach to computational biosecurity in terms of the following. So as I told you, if you think of this health as a concept, then there is a lot of concept monitoring and drift properties that you can address. Uh, you have various types of data which you have to stitch them together. You have to have statistical uh, ability to do that. Uh, but they are generally worth um, their effort. Uh, for computational epidemiology, uh, you could actually simulate and do a lot of work, which many of our um, other presenters have already talked about today morning. For integrating large data for metagenomics and phylogenomics, et cetera, if you're interested in dynamic patterns of pathological evolution, you can let me know. We are interested for that, as well as other kinds of things that we are doing, like single cell genomics, et cetera, to understand antimicrobial resistance. So last but not the least, I'll leave you with the uh, advertisement that we are very interested in big data approaches. If you're interested, uh, you can uh, let me know. You can take part in some of the for events that we keep conducting, including the IEEE Big Data in USA every year. And this year, we are going to do uh, the seventh workshop on big data benchmarking in Delhi. So the poster is also here, and probably also in your institution. We uh, send this poster out to all over the country. So it's done with UCSD and Indian Statistical Institute. Okay. It's on December 14th, 15th, and the registration is still open in India Habitat Center. So thanks to my colleagues and collaborators. They're from all over the world. So this work could not have been possible without uh, very, very uh, active collaboration across different types of teams from different continents. In India, I'm thankful to have collaborators in institutes like National Institute of Immunology. Actually, the speakers were here in for the workshop. Uh, maybe Satyajit Rat, Vinita Bal, you might have heard them. Uh, CDAC, which does provides us uh, some, uh, computing uh, help, as well as uh, organizations like uh, Center for DNA Fingerprinting in Hyderabad. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks to the funding agencies. My contact email address is there. If you're interested, just uh, send a mail. 
Uh, last but not the least, this is a book for reference for yesterday's talk, which I forgot, but if you're interested, it's a very nice book. It came out a few years ago, a couple of years ago. So that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Oh, yeah, sure. So I, I was wondering, um, in your modeling approach, is it a problem to know how many distributions go into your uh, mixed distribution model? What that, the number of clusters or the number of distributions? The, uh, that's a very good pro question because it's a classical problem in mixture models. It's a classical problem in clustering. For example, people say, okay, I did k-means clustering, but I never knew how much the k was, but that's an input, right? Uh, so it's, it's a classical problem. Uh, that also comes from other kinds of other related problems of, of um, in machine learning and statistics. But the way here it gets much more uh, complicated because not only, and that question was raised in another form uh, earlier, not only do we not know what the optimal k or g, the number of uh, components are, we can always use this information theoretic AIC, BIC, all these criteria to see if the model is well fit. But then we have to go back to the immunologist and say, you know what, there is a new population I found and it might be make doing something, something funny. Now that is where the challenge lies. So I can do the best model fitting that's possible from my side, okay. I have done, I have actually, to just to tackle that problem, we did it in a Bayesian way where we actually made that a parameter and, uh, you know, the number of, number of components and tried to get, let the model tell us. So all that is possible from the statistical side. The thing is that finally the immunologist has to make sense of that population. Now thankfully flow cytometry allows you, there are kind of uh, filtering methods are called sorting techniques to actually isolate that population and that cell population and go into the detail. So if you think for example if you are interested in antimicrobial resistance, then you can find a small population or cancer stem cells, a small population of cells which have a different expression. And that probably is giving it the edge of survival or whatever under the stress of the drugs, etc. And then you can bring those populations of cells, isolate them and send them for genomics and see if there's mutations or if there's something else, other kinds of tests, which has to be, for example, if you're interested in cancer stem cells, uh, they would take those cells out and try to see if they can grow a tumor, you know, in the mice or some xenograft or something like that if they have those special properties that you look. In other words, the finally the ve verification has to come from, the validation has to come from the biologist or the immunologist. I can do the best model fitting that is possible from my side, but that is probably not going to serve his purpose unless he has a justification for why those cells are behaving funny. And they could be just some non-clonal properties, it could be just stochastics, just if you do another run, they will vanish. So therefore, another way to go about is to do uh, these in multiple runs. So don't take just one sample or take a sample and do technical replicates or sometimes biological replicates if possible and even, even temporal replicates and then see if that population comes up again and again and again. And it should have the same size, it should have similar expression, it should have, it's, it should not be an artifact, okay. So, Sir, uh, I just want to know the uh, tool for the image registration, that registration thing you are doing, data right. registration. So I can pass you the papers which were published just for the registration because that's an important problem not just here but in okay. image analysis and as in general. Okay. Registration is an important problem. In high dimension it's certainly so because you can't see the Im features. Thank you. Uh, image registration more than three dimension is a NP complete problem. I think more than three or three onwards. Yes, Certainly, yeah. yeah. Anyway. In some softwares are there, I don't know what is that, in some tools. Right, you can obviously approximate, but if it's a complex figure, then uh, it's difficult to do. Okay, thank you. Okay, sure. Uh, so, you know, like you were doing this uh, skewed distributions to kind of, uh, you know, approximate what kind of distribution fits this thing. You showed an example right. where you showed, you know, how well it fits and so on. Then in a subsequent figure you showed that, you know, you had, uh, you know, kind of an experimental three-dimensional, uh, you know, projection. Right. 
Right. And then you fitted that using like I think six or so distributions, right? I mean, um, and before this, yeah, this one, yeah, right, this figure. So, um, so these are all uh, the individual distributions that you fit are again the skewed distributions, yeah, right? Yeah, they are skewed T family. This one, if I remember, this is yeah. from a, a PNAS paper which showed six skew T distributions here. Yeah. And if a, it's, so it's being general family, so if a population is not skewed or not significantly skewed, that is a special case of, the, so the skew parameter will be close to zero, that's it. Yeah, so, so yeah. Uh, actually in relation to what Edgar was mentioning, like, you know, I could think of, for example, the individual skew distribution itself to be made out of some Multiple. more symmetric distribution. Yeah. Right, so, so that is the idea. So actually that's, that's the idea which I was trying to make here. I don't know, that's the idea I was trying to make here. Yeah. So is that one skew distribution or two, distri two symmetric distributions? So finally, it has to be the biologist who I will tell, you know what, there is an asymmetry there. I'm capturing that with my parameter. That's what I was doing in that cancer data, the follicular lymphoma. And do you want to look at that tail? So what that guy will do, and the question is, are there two, is there a divergent cell population doing something extra? So that's what we were doing, for example, in the later cancer study. So when we see this skew distribution, we go and say, you know what, there's a tail population. So probably that tail population has a subset of cells which look very similar to the unimpaired uh, cells, how they were supposed to be. So is that, cell, is that subset conferring something good which is making the outcome good for those patients? So for that validation, I can't do. I can only tell what's happening in terms of there is some skewness being observed. I have captured that. But then the biologist will have to go and isolate those cell populations and see whether they have some properties which is answering the hypothesis. So the final validation has to come from the, the biologist or the immunologist. I don't think we can mathematically answer, at most we can uh, get the signal. So there is something else happening. There is a tail pop phenomena happening. There's something changing. If you think of this as a time course experiment, then you will probably have a uh, tail population which is evolving over time and that may be uh, where the action is. So if you want to capture the action, you have to capture those using some parameters that are sensitive to such geometric changes. The earlier approach did not even have those parameters. So when we made some, put in some parameters, they were captured and you also have to remember that yes, there has to be robustness. That the reason why we are using T is that nothing, not just single cell <laughs> shouldn't so no outlier itself, I mean few outliers should not be so sensitive to always get flagged. So also we want to ignore certain cell populations, uh, uh, so uh, tail populations just because they are there. So for example, those cells there in the tail, bottom there, they just did not express, they're dead cells and debris. Okay, we don't want to capture them just because they are there and ask the biologist what's happening. We, he's saying it's zero, zero expression, there's nothing happening there, there's dead cells probably. So just because they're there, we don't want, we want a mixture of robustness and sensitivity. And these, some of these popular uh, distributions were better suited than others. So this is a, a non-ending game. You kind of yeah. keep new things and you find new, then you have to test. Yeah, so, so when you have those uh, six populations in that uh, data figure, I mean, is one of your criteria what is the minimum number of distributions I need to properly describe this? Uh, no, Dis that, that there are criteria of how the mixture is best fit. So those okay. are mostly information theoretic criteria, BIC type methods. There are variations of that. There are books written on that, okay, uh, optimal model selection type methods. The thing is that if you want to be convincing in terms of finding uh, these rare cell populations, which have something like 100 cells out of a million cells, they're very rare, 100 out of million. Okay, relatively very rare. So then uh, in order to find them, how do you, I mean, I may be able to find them, but how do you validate them? There are two ways that we can do. One is from my side, I try to see replicates and see if they, I keep on finding them in the replicate. So there's a consistency of finding them. And second thing is the biologist side, I tell him, can you isolate and do something about it biologically? All right, so if there are no further questions, let's thank the speaker once more. And there's coffee outside, so we should get back here at 3.30. Yeah, yeah. Uh, be convinced this is a very general method. So I'm not trying to sell you just immunophenotype analysis using flow cytometry. So it's a very general method. You could use them for various other things. Thank you.